The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Keep clapping. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'll do a little bit of housekeeping stuff really quick. Things first off, the pirate symbol in the back has nothing at all to do with my talk. It's just a holdover from an old work talk, and I'm too lazy to change the slide background. So, and I notice that and I look at it. Um, my name is Dan Washko. You might have heard me from the Linux Link Tech Show. Uh, you might have heard part of this talk on the Linux Link Tech Show. But before I get started, I'm just curious, uh, how many people in here have been using Linux more than five years? And how many people have been using Linux less than three years? And how many people have used anything other than Ubuntu? Okay, pretty good. Anybody use Slackware? Good, good, good. All right. <laughs> has, has anybody ever tried Linux from scratch in here? Okay, good, good. All right, well... Okay, let's get started then, we'll roll on here. Now, originally my talk was slated to be Linux from scratch, but I, I always like to slip Slackware in wherever I could because I, it's a great thing. But so my focus today is going to be talking about um, Linux, learning Linux, and how I went about you know, learning Linux for myself and applying it and applying it to doing Linux from scratch, which is a project that I always wanted to try for a long time and I thought uh, would be a wonderful learning experience and to share my experiences with you on that and how you can get started pretty easily using Linux from scratch. Okay, what do I know? Well, I have a BA from psychology from Penn State and I love people so much that I decided to go into the computer field because uh, <laughs> it, was, it was so... Yeah, that, that's a piece of work there, but, um... You didn't have enough problems? No, you, <laughs> you know what, I have a lot fewer problems. <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, Sorry, I'm oh, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay, uh, I started using Linux in about 1998, so I, I came in after the floppy disk phase, and right around when stuff was uh, being able to be purchased in box sets. In fact, um, it was around 1998, a little before when I switched from the psychology career, getting into computers and doing break fix and trying to get into systems administration. Um, I was working at a local Staples to dead up tech bench there. So of course, when you work there, you have to do the sales and that was terrible. But that's where I came upon my first copy of Red Hat in a box set. And I had been working with computers for a little, all, all my life I've been messing around with computers. TI-994A was my first computer. And as I've said in a show in the past, um, I was not allowed to play games on my computer. I had to program everything, as my father said. So I've been working with computers and enjoying them for a very long time until I got to high school when, you know, just life took over and females and everything else more interesting than computers. I got back into it then after I graduated, was working in the psychology field. So I ended up, you know, getting back into computers and being very interested in networking. And as I, as I talked with people saying, you know, go do your MCSE, get some Windows computers, network them together, and, and go from there. And I was, I was enjoying myself, but there was always something missing. Um, I wanted to know how this stuff actually worked, what was going on under the hood. And I've ta I talked with other people, you know, around my peer group, and they were like, yeah, I'd really like to build my own operating system or get involved in it under the hood. And when I, when I came upon Linux, um, I had no idea what it was. I picked up the box set, I read it, it looked very interesting, and I started playing around with it. And um, I saw that this was going to be a great tool to help me fill in the gaps of the knowledge that, that I wanted to, I was missing in using other operating systems. Um, and as I gained more knowledge, uh, as, as a lot of peers that I met, 
we want to share this knowledge, got involved with doing the Lehigh Valley Linux users group and sharing our knowledge that way. And then that's how the Linux Link Tech Show started and getting involved with everybody else in the podcasting universe to, to come together and find ways to actually share knowledge. Uh, am I right on the right slide? I wish this would change on both screens. Okay. Okay, so when people first start with Linux, of course, as I did, you come to Linux through a Linux distribution, which is a great tool of, uh, that delivers a functional Linux-based system, so I call it distribution. And as I thought about this, and I've thought about it over the years, I said there's a few things that separate Linux different distributions from others um, that I have noticed over the years. And, and this is just my categorization. It has nothing to do with anything other than my opinion. But um, I'd say look at a, what I would call kind of a first tier. Top tier distribution are usually the popular distributions. Um, like your Ubuntu, your Fedoras, OpenSUSE, Mandriva. These, these are great distributions that provide a fully functional suite, and they try and um, make it easier for people to administer, to get going with these distributions. So you have stuff like the Ubuntu Control Center, the Software Center Aptitude. Uh, I like to lump in these package managers in here. Um, you have system configuration utilities. Anybody remember uh, Red Hat Linux, Linux Conf? I remember playing around with that. Yast in OpenSUSE and SLED, yet another system administration tool. And Mandriva, Linux Control Center, which used to be DrakeConf. It's, it's a great place to go in and manage your Linux systems um, and, and add users and do different tasks and administrative tasks. It's very, very nice and very configurable. But, and it makes life easier. But they also can obscure the inner workings of the system. Um, there's simplicity up front, there's usually some complexity in the back with how they can edit the files and, and manage it. And it all comes back to, uh, really comes back to text files in the background. That you don't need all these tools to do it, and I wanted to learn that, how to do that in the background. Um, one of the biggest examples I like to look at with complexity is if you compare like how you manage gconf settings as compared to just editing a simple RC file. Uh, you know, you just look at a text file, here's a variable, here's a value, here's a variable, here's a value. Gconf, you pull up this registry type editing application, and it's easy on the front end, but if you try and do it manually, it's a little more complex. So the tools on the top tier distributions, I think, kind of obscure some of the stuff that you might want to know in the background, because if these tools break or they do something you don't expect, it's good to know. What exactly did these tools do in the background to make a user, to add a user to the system or to change a configuration in a sound file or whatever? And, and those distributions really focus on their tools as opposed to telling you how to do it in the background. Not to say you can't learn that from these distributions, but that's where I come in then to the second tier distributions, which require a little more attention. The Debian's, the Gen 2's, and the Arch Linux. Now, I love, absolutely love Arch Linux. Sir, oh, you're raising your hand just to, you're giving me one of these, huh? All right. Keep your devil symbols to yourself. <laughs> um, these may not come with the fancy system administration tools, but then again, uh, and they require you to be a little more hands-on, get into editing and configuration files. But one thing they all have in common is they have a fantastic package manager. Okay, and I'll get to this in a few minutes. But um, Great package managers. I love these distributions. You know, people would say, you always hear people talk about Gen 2, which is a great distribution. I, I, I really do like Gen 2. They say it's one that you compile from source. It is source-based, yes, but you don't actually compile the, the, the software yourself. You are running a package management system. I think it was with Caportage. Is that in Gen 2? And you emerge it. And you might have to get some hands on, but it's not the same as unarchiving a tarball and doing the three steps, the uh, configure, make, and pseudo make install, or however you want to do your install. So it is great stuff, and you're going to learn a heck of a lot. The documentation for these three product projects alone is, is stellar. Uh, but it's good. But I still, these great stuff, a little more difficult, a little more hands on. But still, I wanted more. I want more. 
I got the third tier, Slackware, the great vanilla. This is, and I think even Patrick had said when we talked, about, talked with him about Slackware, it's a very vanilla distribution. Um, do, is it the next slide? What I always heard starting out, Red Hat teaches you Red Hat Linux, Ubuntu teaches you Ubuntu Linux, Slackware teaches you Linux. If you want to run Linux, run Slackware. That's what I always heard when I first started out way back in the day. I went from Red Hat to SUSE, and then people said, if you want to learn Linux, learn Slackware. And so I picked up Slackware and started to go with this and with the focus of trying to do as much for myself as possible. And the tools that come with Slackware do not get in your way and obscure a lot of those configuration files that you would edit by hand, which was very beneficial to me starting out. So if I wanted to add users, I mean, there was a couple different ways to add users. You could run the add user or the user add tool, or you can actually go in and add users manually by editing the files. It was a great distribution for learning that, uh, the vanilla philosophy. There's no overall unifying management tools like a, a Linux Conf or a Yast uh, in Slackware. Uh, standard tools that are custom all flavors of Linux. You could do a lot of hand editing of the config files and when you edit them, they don't get overwritten by some other tool that might be running, which is great. Sir? Uh, nice this, this is also true of Jenkins. Right. Yes. No. Right. Don't worry about Gen 2. That's the second tier. It's okay. It's good. It forces someone to be a little more intimate with their system, I think. Uh, now, Gen 2, of course, you do need to be very intimate with your system. You can get into it. It's like the ricer distribution. So you can really tweak the heck out of it. Slackware, I found was, I mean, you get a standard set of, of applications and then when you want to build upon them, it forces you to, to uh, be aware of what's on your system and what you may need as opposed, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, software is, uh, as the developers delivered it, and it has, it does have a package manager. A lot of people say here say Slackware doesn't have a package manager, but it's, Slackware does have a package manager. And Slackware had a great package manager, and then Chess Griffin came along and ru ruined it all with SBO package and made it all easy uh, and, and everything. Uh, but his great, the SBO package is a great, great utility. Uh, but when I was do, uh, working with Slackware originally, and the reason why I started with it and loved it was uh, it gave me the opportunity, it gave me the opportunity to do a lot of compiling. And I came at Slackware and I was like, well, I did Red Hat with RPM and I don't want packages. I said, I'm too good for packages. These aren't for me. I want to learn how to do it. So, you know, I get the base system. I started learning. I started compiling my own kernel. I decided to compile my own X free. Then I did the GNOME, the KDE. That was fun stuff. I did Mozilla. And then after I did Mozilla, that's like, you ever, anybody ever compile Mozilla? Of course, you guys back there did. And after that, I got to saying, you know, this is fun. And I learned a heck of a lot because you get to get in there read the software sources, and it would, the greatest thing is when something breaks. It doesn't work. To actually dig in there and fix it is such a rush the first time you do it. You know, just figure it out yourself, or if you need to tweak something in a source code. It is, it is a rush, and you do learn a heck of a lot. You learn how to use a bunch of the uh, debugging tools. You learn where stuff, you know, the file system structure, where stuff goes. You, you, you get into other things where you might have to uh, learn about making actual devices or making sure devices are present on a system. So I learned a heck of a lot, but then I also learned that there's a reason why package managers with large repositories are awesome, because it, it does make things uh, a lot easier in some respects. All right. Now, before I get into Linux from scratch, let me give you some, some advisable quotes from, that I think along the way that will help you with your Linux from scratch experience. Uh, there's the old adage that practice makes perfect. Now, that has been updated to say practice makes habit. Okay, be aware of that. Uh, if you always approach the same thing over and over again, if you always do what you've always done, you're always gonna get what you always got. All right, so if, if you're running into problems or how you approach a problem, particularly when you're doing something brand new, if you keep coming at it the same way, don't be surprised when you keep getting the same response. You know, if, if something is failing and you keep doing the same thing over and over again, don't be surprised if it keeps failing. I have, sometimes I find myself doing that. I will compile some software, it's broken. Yes? Well, yeah. 
I will compile something and it doesn't work. And then I'll be like, let's just run make again. Still not working. Let's reconfigure. Run make again. Still not working. You know, it, it is, as you can step backwards and do different things, but don't be surprised. Be, try and come at it from a different perspective, you know. And that takes some, some practice of trying to think out of the box and uh, being aware of what you are doing. Uh, and, and what's going on in the software. And as you, you fail more and more, you're going to find different ways to get around that. And that takes me to the next slide. Don't be afraid of failure. It, failure is your friend. A lot of people say to me, is Linux from scratch hard? No, it's not hard. It's a challenge. Um, you, you ask me if something is hard, that's, that's a subjective question. Do I think it was hard when I did it? Not really. I thought it was a challenge, but then that's not a fair question. I mean, I've had a, a couple years of doing this stuff, so I might not approach it from somebody who's only had one or two years of experience. Um, and some people I've I've talked to said it was really it was really a big challenge to get into and try out Linux from scratch. But I'm here to tell you, I followed the steps. I went through it, and I have a successfully booting Linux from scratch system, and I know other people have, and they have a whole project on it, so you can do it, okay? You can do it, but don't be afraid to fail. I failed the first time going through, and I discovered where my problem was, you know, and I learned from that, and I'll pass some of that wisdom on to you because back ticks aren't quotes, and you'll learn that too in just a few minutes. But expect to fail on this if you've never, ever done anything similar to this. Okay, Linux from scratch. This is the exciting part. Uh, it's a project that provides you with the step-by-step instructions for building your own custom Linux system entirely from source code. And that's exactly what you're going to do. Um, if you've never, if you've compiled your own software and installed it on a system, you have probably one step above the person who's never done this before. But my, when, I, when I approached Linux from scratch and I got into it, I was really surprised. And you will come away with this experience for a great appreciation of what the developers of these distributions do just to get a base system installed. There's an incredible amount of work and, and knowledge that goes into this. And you, as trying to learn Linux from Linux on, from scratch or anything, there's an incredible amount of responsibility that's going to be placed upon you to get as much out of this as possible, okay? And I'll explain some of that as I go along. This is what the Linux from scratch website looks like. Very, you know, very basic, Spartan, but very informative. Uh, I just put a screen capture in here because I wasn't sure whether I'd have access to uh, the outside world from here. But there are different flavors of Linux from scratch, and I'll cover those right now. This is the one I'm focusing on is standard Linux from scratch called LFS. Then there's Beyond Linux from Scratch, which extends. From Linux from Scratch, you are going to get a basic bootable Linux distribution uh, or Linux operated, based operating system with some basic tools that you can then take to the next level beyond Linux from Scratch to get stuff like uh, usable applications like Lynx or Lynx. For, and you can go over with Xorg on there and get your desktop environments and do all sorts of stuff with it, but Linux from scratch focuses on getting the base system up. Beyond Linux from scratch is getting some other functional software on there and taking it to the next level. There is automated Linux from scratch, so if you want to, you know, you build a couple of Linux from scratch systems and you start doing this on a regular basis, there's a way to automate the build process. Um, so that's automated Linux from scratch. And there's cross Linux from scratch, which is a building Linux from scratch for uh, cross uh, compilers and different systems, different architectures, uh, teaches you how to do that. Then there's hardened Linux from scratch, which is basically the first two Linux from scratch and beyond Linux from scratch with the focus on security. But again, what I'm focusing on today for learning it is just purposes of Linux from scratch. And we're also going to be using a live CD, which I'll cover in a minute. Linux from scratch has a very basic live CD, which I found was very useful as the beginning process. Now, my project steps and goals that I had, and I'm going to say for you if you want to follow my steps, uh, I used a virtual machine for doing this. Um, again, my goal was learning, not so much as building a functional system that I'm going to use in 
any other way but learning, using a functional environment for like a server or a desktop or anything. So that's why I chose to do it in a virtual environment. Um, so once you get set up with a virtual environment, I use VirtualBox, uh, you get the resources that you need, and I spelled resources wrong. Then you're going to spend a lot of time reading and reading and reading and reading some more. There's a lot of reading involved in this. There's a lot of fun reading, I think. Uh, you're going to build your Linux from scratch system, and then you're going to earn your bragging rights trophy. So you can tell all your friends that I did compile my kernel along with the rest of my operating system. Has anybody compiled the kernel here before? That used to be a big thing back in the day. But not a lot of people do that anymore. Sad. Okay, setting up your virtual environment. Now, I use VirtualBox. Some people don't want to use VirtualBox because it's not Oracle associated with it, but uh, it is open source, and I, it is a very, very, very simple virtual machine to get up and running. I run it on Arch Linux. I run it on uh, Ubuntu, on all sorts of stuff. It is so easy to get up and running and uh, to get going. Now, one of the caveats that I, I run into, and this is important when you're setting up the virtual box environment. I, what, well, sir? Oh, I was just wondering why, why did you do the uh, virtual box instead of just uh, GCC? It, 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 it is possible to just use CH root, so I was wondering what the advantage was to. Yeah, I could, I could use CH root. Um, I, I just wanted this in a separate environment that I could turn on and off very easily. I could pause it if I wanted to. Um, I, I wasn't really thinking about using CH root. I could have used a whole other system to build it on. But I was like, what's the easiest and fastest way I'm going to get up and running on this thing? I'm like, virtual box, why not? I'm just, and, and I did it initially just on a lark just to see what it would be like. But it just, as I continued doing it, it sounded like a wonderful thing. Now, there's a whole, bu a whole bunch of different ways that you can do this. This was just the way I started, and I was recommending if you really want to learn Linux, uh, using Linux from scratch, testing it out, this is a great way to try it. And, um, and for those of you, uh, VirtualBox is a cross-platform thing, so if, if you're you're stupid and you want to use Windows or Microsoft, that's up to you. I, I couldn't think of anything else to say there. But uh, What I would also say is as you're setting up your environment, um, choose SCSI as opposed to IDE. Now, I went and I used IDE. I don't know why I just chose IDE and I built the whole thing. And, of course, it wouldn't boot because um, some of the modern kernels, or depending on which one you have, um, treat IDE devices now like a SCSI device. And it kept on coming back. And you might not be aware of that if you've never run into that or encountered that in your system. Um, because it, you set up the ID device. And even in the documentation, I believe, they talk about pointing it to the IDE device, uh, what it would be instead of a SCSI device. And it might not boot properly for you. It didn't for me, but I knew how to fix it because I just went in and switched it from using the dev HDA to dev SDA. Uh, in, in my F stab, but that's one caveat or a little piece of advice I recommend to you if you've never done something like this or experienced it. Stay with SCSI. Um, simply setting box? Yeah, I'm going to show you that in just a minute. I'll show you. I'll walk you through the virtual box. I'm just giving you a quick overview. Um, make sure you have networking. Uh, ne I, I advise it to have networking. It makes it a whole lot easier to get all the sources that you need. Or you can do a shared directory if you don't want to set up networking in VirtualBox. But it's, it's very simple to do. I mean, you could also do a shared where you pull down all the sources, put them in that shared uh, um, directory that is accessible both outside and inside of VirtualBox. Base memory, I do recommend at least 256 megabytes, maybe more. That's what I did on here. Um, this machine is System76. is about... About five years old now, and uh, I just used uh, 256 megabytes, and I do believe it's a dual core with, uh, let me see, I don't know. I, I keep looking at this, and I never remember. I think it's only like a 1.2 gigahertz processor. So it's not the beefiest system in the world, but um, anyway. And high-speed Internet access is pretty beneficial if you, uh, for getting the sources and everything. All right, storage considerations. Well, before I go all through that, let's, let's pop over there to the, uh, 
Let's pop over to the virtual box and, and take a look at that a second, and I'll show you virtual box. Um, has anybody here not, has, is there anybody who's not familiar with virtual box? There's only, you've never used it, okay. Um, I don't want to get too involved in, in how to actually set it up. It's very simple. You create a machine up here. You just add a new machine, and it'll walk you through what you want to call it. And it'll walk you through the basic steps of, of creating all these settings in here for the virtual machine. Of course, it's like the name, the operating system type, the version of Linux it is. That, there's some tweaks in there that they might throw if you choose specific things like uh, there's like Red Hat, I think, and Arch Linux and Debian, different things. But I just chose Linux 2.6. And then you can get down into configuring the system, base memory. Now, if you decide up front that you want to devote one gig of memory to it, and then as you're working with it and you say, well, you know, I don't really need that much, you could always come back in here and alter the base memory size. And it allows you to choose boot orders and stuff, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The type of display, you can, uh, how much video memory you wanna, wanna add and different things. And then of course your storage. Um, with the storage, I went with this structure. Approximately 13 gigabytes should be fine. Now in VirtualBox and in most virtual machines, you, you define a storage device. Um, as you notice, I chose an IDE controller here. That's why I say don't do that. Make it SCSI. It'll save you some headaches, possible headaches in the long run. But if I want to add, or when I go through the process of creating, I can go down and add a new CD, DV, DIV controller. No, I don't, I don't want to do that one. A new disk, an IDE controller, create new disk. And if I walk through the process, there's a fixed storage size and there's dynamically expanding storage size. Uh, the big difference between those, as it says right there, is with fixed, I can tell it 13 gigabytes, that's the size of it, no bigger. All right, with dynamically expanding storage, it takes up, you define a size that you want to allow it to grow to but the initial size is significantly smaller. Like if I did the 13 gigabytes, it, alloc you know, it has the ability to allocate 13 gigabytes, but it may only initially create two or three gigabytes in the partition size. So it will grow as you need it. Um, so just be aware of that. If you're, if you're limited on space, um, just be aware of what you're setting your hard disk storage type to. Uh, sir. You mean the dynamic expanding? Um, I haven't experienced any. I never experienced any. But then again, I usually choose a fixed storage size. Now, when you're building these packages, uh, compiling, they will tell you up front with each package approximately how much space is going to take up. Um, so just be aware of that. You're going to, in some cases, uh, expand that storage pretty fast. You know, expand into it, and it's going to be a rather fluid because you're going to compile those sources, and it might be about a gig of space that it takes up with the compiled source. But then, when you're finished, you're gonna you can easily get rid of all that. But just be aware of your size and your space limitations that you have on your system. Um, I have never had a problem or heard of a problem with dynamically expanding storage. Has anybody here had issues with it, sir? Yeah, Windows I had problems with it when I was running Windows as a host. Uh huh. Okay, um, if you have any concerns, I recommend staying with a fixed storage size. It just might be easier overall. What, again, what that's initially gonna do is when it creates that, that virtual image, it's going to be 13 gigs, as opposed to it being maybe two or three gigs to expand the 13 gigs or whatever on it. And so just be aware, aware of that. Um, does somebody else wanna say something? Yeah, that, that, and that's, that could be a, a possibility. As I, I didn't try it on the dynamically expanding, 
But again, like I said, you could rapidly fill up that space and it require it to expand itself. So as it's compiling and trying to expand the amount of disk that you can use, disk space that you can use in virtually, it might ser slow things down and, and make it a little, a little less fun. Um, I didn't mess around with audio. Whoops, wrong thing. I didn't mess around with audio at this point. Networking, I attached network one adapter use NAT so that uh, it would pool and give itself a DHCP address. Uh, let me think here a second. I'll probably have to show you when I boot. Be aware that I do believe it assigns a 10 dot number in here. When I actually boot the system, uh, if I forget, remind me. Huh? Yes. Yeah, and I think the first one is the gateway, or 10.1 or 10.2 is the gateway. Be aware, because you can't, you, you have to assign, I would recommend when you get in there, I'll show you, but sticking with above is 10 dot something dot something, 10 and above. Because one and two are used for specific purposes, one of them is the gateway, and if you assign it to one of those addresses, you're not gonna get the results that you want. But I, I just remembered about that and I forgot to put it in here. But I'll explain that when we actually boot the virtual machine. Um, so there is some stuff. Read some of the documentation if you're not as familiar with virtual machine, uh, virtual box, or whatever virtual solution that you're going to use. Uh, get a little familiar with it. But uh, that's basically what my setup was. Uh, disk drives, setting up the uh, disk storage, the uh, video, I only left like basic, I think it was four megabytes, because I'm not doing anything graphic, it's all text-based at this point. And then of course memory. The more memory you allocate to it, uh, the faster your, your, your compiles are gonna be, but there's gonna be a limit, because it is a virtual system. Uh, and I think that's processor. Uh, if you have, um, you can set processors how many you want to assign based upon how you have. It's virtual processors if, you're, if your system supports it. Uh, and a bunch of di different things. I left most of this at the defaults. I'm not overly concerned about performance because this was a leisure activity. Now, granted, I built this over about two months on my free time and having a fun time. So just be aware of that. Now, oh, let's go back again then to storage considerations. 13 gigabytes should be fine, but as you read the documentation, be aware that they're gonna start talking about 100 gigabytes, uh, 250 gigabytes in some places, really large stuff, um, looking towards the future. If you build Linux from scratch, 13 gigabytes to do, it's just probably more than you need, but 13 gigabytes uh, with a um, minimum of 1.3 gigabytes to be able to compile and install all the software. But I set it to 13. Um, to get the sources and, and put it all in there for compiling and with the uh, thought of maybe doing beyond Linux from scratch after this point. So I set my root partition to 11 gigabytes. They say a minimum of 1.3 gigabytes. I set a home partition of one gigabyte. Uh, I set a 150 megabyte boot partition and then an 850 megabyte swap partition. Um, you don't have to go into all that sub-partitioning at all. You could just make it all under root. Of course, they do recommend a separate boot partition, and in some cases, that might make it easier. Um, but that was my partitioning scheme, and I did not come close to using that much space on there. So it's just, it's in the documentation, so you can follow that. Now, the Linux from scratch build process that I followed was get the documentation, Get the live CD, okay, and grab the source files. Stage one is where you're going to build the tool chain. Stage two is when you're actually going to build your Linux from scratch system. Uh, then you're going to configure it, and then you can enjoy it. Now I'm going to walk through these stages uh, a little more detail. Now documentation. When I built my Linux from scratch system, I, I said in a recommendation, uh, it, it's helpful to have a dual monitor based system or a widescreen monitor because I had the documentation open right here and my virtual machine open right here. Reading, working, reading, working. It made it a whole lot easier. You can flip back and forth. You can have separate machines. I don't care, but that was what worked for me. It was very convenient. Um, 
Now, the documentation is really, is really good and it's pretty detailed and you can get it online right here, Linux from scratch. Uh, this is what it looks like if you want to read it in HTML. Pay table of contents, pull it down. Uh, it's very laid out in great sections. It tells you how to uh, go through each step and we'll come back to this documentation in a minute. You can do it like this, like I did online or you can pull it down in a PDF, there's a PDF file, or you can pull all the HTML files offline. There's not a lot of pretty pictures in it. In fact, I don't think there are any pretty pictures in it. It's just mostly text. This is kind of what it looks like. The PDF file is pretty much the exact same as the online HTML, what it goes through. Um, so either way that you want to do it, even if you want to take a word and print it out, because you don't want to waste your printer ink on this, you could do that too. But what I, like I said, what I had going on was Documentation on one screen, virtual machine on the other. And that was one of the benefits of the virtual machine. Now, the Linux from scratch live CD. You need to build Linux from scratch from an existing Linux system, okay? Now, before you go from your existing Linux system or environment to having a customized Linux distribution, you need to have the tool chain in between in that process. So what you're trying to get to uh, from an existing system that may be configured in specific ways is trying to get to a generic tool chain uh, that in some ways might be more uh, customized to your hardware but get, get away from any you want to get a vanilla tool chain is kind of what you want to do and then from that tool chain build your Linux from scratch system okay and that's where it, it, the Linux from scratch live CD comes in um, I thought it provided some of the best environment you could go, you'll read through the documentation. If you don't want to do the Linux from scratch live CD, you can build it from an existing Linux system. You can build it from another live CD. Um, you can even install a version of Linux inside of a virtual machine and build it from there. Now, I chose the Linux from scratch live CD because I'm a little lazy sometimes, and it was right there. The documentation said, go ahead and go for it. Um, so you pull that down. It's a fairly small CD, and in here, under virtual machine, you can come up under the settings and where you have your storage devices, go ahead and right here is add a CD, DVD device, and you can choose a disk image as opposed to, as opposed to actually a CD drive device. So I just grabbed the L Linux from Live, Live CD from their site, pulled it down, got the ISO, and now I set it up as the device to be mounted at boot and actually at CD-ROM, DVD-ROM is where boot order right there I set it for and that boots straight into Linux from scratch CD. So you're really good to go. Now you read the documentation and Linux from scratch CD, so the Linux from scratch documentation will say, you know, this CD is a little out of date. Okay, you might have a hard time booting it on SATA, uh, systems with SATA devices and everything, but the beauty of using a virtual machine is you don't have to worry about that because it, you're not worried about the latest and greatest hardware. You can set it to be IDE or SCSI device, SCSI is what I recommend, so you don't have to worry about it being too out of date for your current system because you're using a virtual machine. Um, so that's, that's a bonus right there. So I recommend, for the learning experience, get the Linux from scratch live CD. Then you're going to need to get the source files, but that's after we, uh, we boot into uh, our environment. Okay, Toolchain, like I said, is a clean environment to build Linux from scratch. It's built from your existing Linux from scratch, or Linux system, and what I use as the, quote, existing Linux system is Linux from scratch. Now, if you choose not to use their live CD, um, they do provide some information and documentation of what you need to look out for, or what may, some of the caveats you may have on building a system uh, from the different tools and how they're configured with different distributions. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Now, this is where I talked about it might be a bit outdated. Um, you could use an existing live CD or whatever, and then boot the ISO in the virtual box, and that was configured under storage devices. Uh, I think the Linux from Scratch Live CD is a few years old. It hasn't been updated. And they say in the documentation it may not support some SATA uh, controllers. So if you have a newer system that has SATA drives in it with the SATA controllers, 
it might not boot properly and recognize those devices. But that, that's why I say if you're... Yeah, that's when you're doing. If you're in a virtual environment, that limitation is kind of, you, you really don't have that limitation of worrying about it being on newer hardware. Because um, the virtual environment generally is configured for a generic, well supported uh, hardware system. Uh, okay, already went through here. Read documentation. You're going to have to do a lot of reading. Virtual machine. You know, you have your virtual machine ready with networking. You have your Linux live CD, uh, LSF live CD ready to boot. Read the documentation. There's a, it, it's not very long, okay? So go ahead and begin reading it. Reading it a couple times. Really give it a thorough read, all right? Because this is important. This is, I think, the, the, the important part of this. You can sit down, set this environment up, and follow everything right along, step by step. But I really suggest so there's no surprises to you. Read the documentation beforehand. And that's the way I did it. I read, you know, I read through it first, and then I came back, followed the steps, step by step, read the documentation. And as I got to each step, I read the documentation, went back, did everything, got the results that I wanted, expected, read the documentation, went on to the next step. So you're going to have to do a lot of reading. So what happens then is you're ready to go. You're going to boot into the build environment. Uh, and I will set that going right now because that takes a couple of seconds. Let me fire this off and start it up. This is what it looks like when you boot from the Linux from scratch CD. Kill it off. Not very amazing. It looks just like uh, almost any other distribution that doesn't hide the uh, boot process behind a fancy graphical display screen. Anyway, you're going to boot into the uh, build environment. You're going to run through a standard of FDisk to set your partitions. You're going to create your file systems in there. You're going to mount your partitions. And inside those mounted partitions, you're going to create the source directory, which you're going to work from. And then you're going to download your sources. Uh, you can download any source that you want, you know, following through there. If there's a newer version of tar or there's a newer version of, of gzip or bzip, you can go with that. They recommend in the documentation for this project, follow the steps, use their sources. You'll have the best results. Um, wget is your friend. If you go in the documentation, it tells you to wget the uh, source list right there, then you can use that source list to pull down all the sources. It'll take you, depending on your high-speed internet connection, a few minutes. It only took me a few minutes to pull it down. Um, and it's so easy. All right? You can spend a day pulling them down individually, but if you just use wget with this and that list, it'll pull it down automatically in just a few minutes. And you'll be happy you did that. Oh, I just decided to point out to you that dollar sign $LFS is the environmental variable to your LFS mount point, which is covered in excruciating detail over and over again in the documentation. Okay, back to my tips again, suggestions. Read each page entirely, type all commands. Type it all in. Don't copy and paste it in. Get familiar with the system, all right? Uh, there's some really cool stuff in there. You're going to be using uh, awk. You're going to be using sed. You're going to, you're going to be using um, echo in text redirection in some pretty cool ways that you might not be used to. And you'll learn some stuff. You're like, well, I don't need to use VI anymore. I could just use cat. And that's all I need. <laughs> you know? It's, it's really cool. It's fun. You're going to learn that. Um, double check everything. I can't stress this enough. Double check everything. Triple check it and then check it again. Because a lot of times, there's some pretty complicated command strings in there that you need to type in. And if you get it wrong, you got to start all the way back in the beginning. If you get it wrong and don't realize you got it wrong, you're not going to find out until, you know, five or six weeks or days later that you screwed something up. And then you're like, why isn't this working? Because I went through that. I built the whole tool chain. And I got through about a third of the actual build process. And, I'm, and I do a test, and it's like, fails. I, I recompile, I do the test, fails. Again, still doing the same thing over and over again, over and over, build it, fail. I'm like, what the hell? All right, so I had to go, I stepped back. I went back a couple of steps. Everything fine up there, fail. It's because, it's because of this. <laughs> a, 
A single quote is not a back tick. All right, be aware of that in some of these cases. There's little things like that. Because um, when you're looking at the documentation, let me, let me pull it up. Well, let me pull something up here. Uh, where's a good interesting one? Where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. Oh, they cut my... When you, when you have to type all this stuff in by hand sometimes, I can't remember which the, which the one is. There's one that is like this long, but it's like a bunch of different said commands with back ticks and single quotes, and it's, and, and it's complicated. Just that's what it looks like. Be aware of that. Um, double check everything. Okay. Oh, I finished everything. Did, hold on, I'm sorry about that. One second. Uh, can you repeat what you were saying? And that's where experience comes into play right there. But that's some good advice. Um, where was I? Uh, anyway. Let's get back to where I was. Okay. Let's look at a quick, uh, I'm getting close to the end of the time, but page layout, kind of when you're looking at the page. Now, what's really cool about this is so you can judge how long certain things are going to take you. Each page is laid out with a package name and then what is called the standard build unit. And the first package that you compile, I think it Ben Utils, they call one standard build unit. Okay, so if you time that, um, based upon how long it took you to compile Ben Utils, they give you a standard build unit for all the other packages. So something like uh, GCC might be, five, I'll show you that in a minute. We, yeah, actually, I'll show it to you right now. Glib C, it says approximate build time, 6.9 standard build units, is going to take you approximately seven times as long to build Glib C as it did for bin utils. So if you time the first one or you run time on that, it'll kick back how long it took to compile, and then you can base upon how long it's going to take. So you can start the build process, and of course, once you start to build, after you finish reading it and reading it again and then following the directions to build it, and you start the build process, all that fun extra time gives you the opportunity to continue reading through the pages on here. And this is actual part of the build process, constructing Linux from scratch. Uh, they go into more detail on how to, what, what the, uh, they go into detail into what the uh, meaning of the configuration options are. And when you get into the bottom of this, uh, on the actual build, part, if I go down to like said, they will cover the actual commands, a brief synopsis of the commands and libraries and stuff that are included. So like package config, where's a good one? Like GCC, they will come down here and you get a really good idea with short descriptions of what gets installed, programs, libraries and stuff, so you get a better feel for what's on your system, what things do. Um, pr particularly when you get involved with the text processing packages, you'll, you'll see some commands that are in there cut uh, and, and other commands that you might not be familiar with, but it'll tell you, well, this is what it's going to do. And then you can look it up further uh, in man pages or in info pages or online or actually read the sources. Okay, so you read and documentation. So the documentation here is really good, lays it out, will give you a short description of what's in there. And then that's where I say the onus is upon you to then explore further. Read the doc documentation included with the sources. Go to the web pages and stuff um, where you get the, the documentation from uh, and the sources from. And uh, really take the time to get involved in this. And the more you put into it, the more you are going to get out of it.
Uh, okay, short description. So read the source code files, like I said, the readme, install, fact, other documentation, code files. When I was, you know, those are always helpful to read, even though you might have some of it uh, outlined for you in Linux from scratch, and they're going to walk you through. Get yourself familiar with these files, uh, and it tells you how to install and some of the different configuration options. Now, of course, Linux from scratch is geared to building a Linux from scratch system, but if you start reading the source code files and documentation, as you go further on down the line and you want to build your own packages, uh, and distribution doesn't come with a piece of software, you want to install it, it's a good place to get used to reading this stuff so you can see what different switches you can configure, how to get that information, uh, actually how to install it, and then some caveats in the fact or where to get help. After you're done building the tool chain process, like I said, first stage is, is um, setting up everything. Second stage is building the tool chain process. You actually do it almost Linux from scratch twice. So what you do, you build the tool chain, which is almost a full Linux from scratch system. You build the tool chain, then you use that tool chain to compile Linux from scratch. Once you get to the point of building the Linux from scratch tool chain, they recommend it, and I also recommend it. Back it up, make a copy, zip it, or not zip it up, uh, gzip it up or bzip it up, save it. You can use that later on to do the whole process again, but just, just keep it so you don't taint it or anything and have a backup copy because backups are very smart. Sir? Virtual box snapshot feature work for that? You could do that, but it might be, um, you'd save just a lot of space. Just, it's not very large, and you, you could save that. It's going to save the whole thing. In this case, I'm just talking about saving the compiled uh, tool chain. So you could actually then, if you wanted to repeat this again somewhere else, you could take that tool chain out and you could either reuse it in a virtual machine or you could use it somewhere else. Uh, and same architecture, of course. Did that answer your question? But you could do a, a snapshot. Okay, then after, uh, after you have the tool chain built, this is where you're going to use SheRoot to uh, get to build your new system. Um, you're going to set additional mount points, uh, proc, dev, different things like that. And this all covered in the book. Um, you're going to root into your new root. You're going to then walk through creating your new directory structure. You're going to set your paths. The interesting thing in this is how the tool chain works. You want, you want a vanilla system. You want a system that's geared you know, just plain vanilla to use as a tool chain. But as you build the software, instead of using the tool chain software, you want to start using the software that you've compiled for the system. So that's why you set the path like this, and it goes through there. It looks in the standard system path, your, your root path right now for the uh, possible um, binaries and applications that it needs that it wants to use. Uh, and if it doesn't find it, the last place it looks is the Linux from scratch tool chain and it starts using those. So as you start building the software and compiling it, it's going to put it into your root directory and use that before, uh, use that in preference of the tool chain. So you then get a truly customized system. Uh, compile and test everything. Tool chain, you don't have to, but I recommend, you know, if it says to do a test, go ahead and do the test of the software. So what it does, it will can, uh, you, you're going to configure it, you're going to compile it, and then you're going to uh, make the software and make the test, and, and it'll do the process of the test. And the tests are successful, you know with pretty good confidence that it should, be, it should be good. If the tests fail, that's a really good indication that you missed something along the way and might have to go back a step or two. Um, so that's why I say do run all tests. And then while the stuff is compiling, read the project files. After everything's done, you get to go on the grub, uh, configuring grub to be the booting because you're going to have all the software and that's when we, you can go listen to my other presentation from last year of the Linux boot process focusing on grub, which then leads to my other presentation the previous year, which is the entire Linux boot process. But that's, uh, anyway, that's nothing. But um, you're going to have yourself, after you configure grub, a system that you can actually boot into. Uh, and this is the Linux from scratch live CD, which gives you a generic. Is, is there anybody who's never run a live CD or a Linux setup in here? Obviously not. That's what you get. It's just, it's just a generic. I don't even know why I booted into it. A waste of time. So I'm going to. <laughs> that, that, that absolutely shows you nothing.
But I'm going to reset this because I want to select my boot device and instead of I'm going to boot off my IDE controller. And here we go. This is Linux from scratch once you get it done. And, and uh, it's just Linux, a generic Linux system. Decompresses, it just looks, and uh, it boots. There's no thrills here. I mean, there is thrills. This is exciting, actually. Uh, this, is, this is great. When, when you get to this point, you're going to be very happy. And you're going to have learned a lot. And this is what it's going to look like, but you're not going to get KD, uh, GDM, so don't expect to log right into X. Uh, and you can see where things might fail, things might succeed. And you'll know what all this stuff usually means. One, one other caveat I will say. <laughs> This is, this is where I said, okay, adding IP address, 10.2.15. I stayed there. Um, that's what I was talking about. 10.0.2.1 is the gateway. 15 is what I added to this just to be on the safe side. But beware, 1 and 2 are used specifically. Don't use them on, on your, for your machine inside. Um, what, was, what was I just thinking of? What was the other caveat I was going to say? What was I talking about? Before I got sidetracked by this. Yes. Thrill a minute. Thrill a minute. Um, there was something else I wanted. Maybe it'll come back to me. Uh, oh, another caveat to be aware of. Just keep in your mind, and they do talk about this. Doing this inside a virtual machine is easy because you can attempt to pause it and save it and shut down your machine and bring it back up. Now, I never actually did that because I've had experience in the past where I paused it. Now, this was uh, pausing a virtual machine running for my father, Windows 2000, inside of Ubuntu system. And when I restarted, it didn't really work too well. But I never paused because I never shut down my machines. Uh, but occasionally, I just shut it down. If, if wherever you are in the process, OK, Make sure that you're aware. If you're in a tool chain, um, you're going to need to reset those environmental variables. OK? If you are in the root environment and you shut down and come back to continue to process, you're going to need to reset that whole environment back up again. It's very easy, but you're just going to need to be aware of having to set that up. Now, Last couple of things, where to get help, Linux from Scratch website is very informative. They have an IRC server, their mailing list, uh, not as, as, as informative as I thought it was going to be with the mailing list, you get some. Uh, seek out IRC channels on Freenode, I'm always in Cast Planet, I'll give you help any way I can. There's always sorts of great, all great people that you can go to. Uh, most importantly, have fun, this is fun, okay? Don't get over, if you're getting frustrated, stop, take a break, go on to something else for a little bit. Uh, my informational sources, uh, my link information, this will be made available, I don't know from where, but it'll be available from my website. Uh, I'll talk about it on Tilts, uh, about where it's available too. I have recorded it myself, so it'll be available soon, probably end up on Hacker Public Radio sometime. Uh, and let the magic begin, I'd love to finish with my favorite monkey video. Uh, and any questions that you may have, sir? Build your own lin uh, computer? Uh, you mean like building from? Oh, just. There are a lot of, I'll, I'll tell you what, there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, is Tom's Hardware a good place to go for that anymore? Stop by my, my t the table and we'll have more discussion about that because I'll give you some more advice. Anybody else with a question? Any, sir? Um, so no. No. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> what, uh, for someone who's uh, technically proficient but just doing this for the first time, 
uh, like I'm assuming you were when you started. What, what do you think, like uh, three days of effort, a week of effort? Oh, hell no. No, 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 no. Well, three days if that's all you're doing for three days. Okay. No, there, there's, it, takes, it takes a lot of time, okay? And most of that time is compiling the software. I mean, you can read the documentation and all that, but like I said, I did this um, on my sp spare time at night, approximately devoting an hour or two maybe per night, or just compiling one or two programs a night, and it took me about two months. Now, that wasn't every single night, but there were some days where I just compiled one program. There were some days I compiled, spent a couple hours on it. It's going to take a significant amount of time. Now, you can do it in a weekend. I've heard people doing it on a weekend. depends on the speed of your system. depends on how much you're going to sit there and watch everything and continue to process. So it's, it's going to take a significant amount of time. If you ever did a gen, if you ever done Gen 2, it'll take you a little bit longer than Gen 2 to get a base system up. Anybody else? Question? I thought I saw a hand up over there. That was not me. <laughs> yes. I know what time it is, but this is important stuff. People want to know. Thank you, thank you for your time. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.